Well, good evening. And yes, I'd like to thank Carol and Frank and everybody for inviting me here. It is a great pleasure to be here. And what I would like to do for you this evening is to give you really an insight into the context of many of the areas that we're going to be hearing about and already have heard about this weekend. Because we hear much about conspiracy, we hear much about conspiracy theories, conspiracy fact, but where does it really come from? What does it mean when you stand back and you see it in a wider perspective? Because one of the problems that we have in trying to convince the world that there are conspiracies occurring is that the media, the mainstream, will always say, well, if things like that were really going on, we would know about it. It would have happened before. Well, of course, these things have been happening, in fact, since history began. And so when you look back at where conspiracy thinking began, you will very quickly realize the kinds of things that we are concerned about today uh, have been going on for many centuries. And, of course, the problem that we have is that it is still not recognized. And the other problem that we have is that the technology has changed. And now, of course, that the ultimate dream of a conspirator can now be more easily realized. And that is the danger. But at the same time, that technology can be used to balance it. So I'm going to today look back through a conspiracy history of the world. We cannot cover everything, of course, and I'm going to pick out some fairly mainstream areas uh, because they are the conspiracies that are in the public consciousness. And there will be, for everything I mention, a hundred other viewpoints, a hundred other things I could say and include. I am simplifying, of course, but it's interesting to see the patterns that unfold as time goes by. So I begin with this symbol because, of course, we see much about this in the conspiracy world, the all-seeing eye or the eye of providence as it's really known. And let's see that in its proper context. So this symbol was created as the Great Seal of America uh, around 1776. And of course, the foundation of the state of America was a, a huge event on the world stage. And there is no question that Freemasonry was a big influence behind this. So this symbol is indeed very Masonic. But the Masonic world will tell you that there is nothing evil, there is nothing wrong about this symbol, that it simply represents the divine being at the top and the then 13 states of America as they were then below. But of course, you will probably know that many people today see it in a more negative light. They see the eye as being the illumined ones, those who govern our lives, who think they are above us, and that they are disconnected from the pyramid, and we're all down here somewhere at the bottom. So the conspiracy world sees this symbol as an oppressive, dark, evil symbol. And in fact, this is how many people see it that in fact we're trapped within the pyramid. We can't see that we're trapped within the pyramid most of the time because we are within it. And certainly it is true that the majority of people in the world do not realize the cage that they are in. And the gift that people like yourselves have is that you have had the insight to see what's going on, to step outside of the pyramid and see that it is a cage. And those with that insight, of course, have a responsibility to try to share that knowledge, to try to tell people who are still stuck on the inside, look what's going on. And these, I think, are very important missions, if you wish, that we need to take on, is the sharing of this information. So this, however, is not a modern construct. Let's go back in history a couple of thousand years and you will have all heard of the great fire of Rome. So Rome, first as a republic, then as an empire, was of course very influential. It was hugely important on the world stage. And this image here of the famous Nero, the Emperor Nero, playing music while Rome burned down, is still a perfect symbol for modern conspiracy thinking. 
it encapsulates everything. Because here is a leader, not really in tune with the needs of his people, only in tune with his own needs and those cronies around him. There is his own city burning, and he seems not to care. Because in the eyes of many people, he himself had actually caused that fire or given the orders for the fire and blamed another group. He blamed in those days the early Christians. So this is the same thing that's still going on today, of course that many people believe there are inside jobs, that there are plots which are designed to make it look like somebody else was responsible so that they can then justify sanctions against the people they want to control. And there is a name associated with this act, which is false flag. The false flag attack. And in fact, that was based on a real tactic that not only the Romans but other ancient cultures would use, where you would attack your own ships under the colors and flags of the enemy to make it look like the enemy had struck so that you would then be able to justify hatred against that enemy and then justify the wars and the withdrawals of freedoms that were necessary to help you win against the enemy. Well, of course, this is exactly what people think is still going on today. So what we may see as modern conspiracy theory is nothing of the sort. It is a continuation of a pattern that has been going on for a very long time. And of course, the Romans, what they were trying to do was create a unified world. Here is a map of the Roman Empire as it was pretty much at its height. And they were trying to create a world order, the world that they knew at that time. They pretty much governed it all for a while. And this is a dream that I think today there are people who look enviously at. Some would say the EU project is another attempt to bring this into being. And of course, there have been many attempts over the years to try to bring the world under one control and put uh, many decisions in the hands of very few people. Now, we could keep going through history and find many, many examples of this kind of thing. But I'm going to leap forward here to the Tudor times. And in Elizabethan England, we we find the seeds of what would become the British Empire, because it may seem incredible today, but once upon a time, Britain effectively ruled nearly two-thirds of the world. And I'm not saying that was done for good reasons or by good means, because it certainly wasn't. But the seeds of that were very much in the Tudor times. Queen Elizabeth I was very influential. They defeated the Armada. There were many plots and conspiracies that you could pick out from Tudor times. Uh, And indeed, if you read my book, Conspiracies, there's more about this, because there's many fascinating events that took place that have resonance with what is occurring today. Uh, And yet I will pick out just one conspiracy here which will take us on to something which may have resonance with modern times again. Of all the plots against Elizabeth, most of them were Catholics trying to unseat her because she represented the then Church of England. Okay, But then there was another plot right at the end of her reign where this man here, the Earl of Essex, Robert Devereux, in 1601, um, had a grudge against the court. He felt his standing was not important enough. And so he mounted a rebellion, and around 300 of his soldiers marched into London, and there was an attempt to basically unseat the Queen. Well, cutting a long story short, And if you go and see the film Anonymous about the Shakespeare conspiracy, you will see the Essex Rebellion shown in that film. But cutting a long story short, it didn't work. Robert Devereux was executed, but there were people left over from that rebellion who would go on to create one of the most famous conspiracies of all time. And one of the survivors of the rebellion was this man here, Robert Catesby. Now, Robert Catesby, you may not know the name, but you will almost certainly have heard of the plot that he helped create, because Catesby was one of the founders of the gunpowder plot. By 1605, King James I had come to the British throne, and he was essentially expected to be very Catholic-leaning. His mother, bear in mind, had been Mary, Queen of Scots, who had been executed on the orders of Elizabeth. But in fact, when he came to power, 
he did not return the country to Catholicism, and he decided to keep the Church of England. Now, that angered many Catholics. There was persecution against them in those times. And so the gunpowder plot was, in essence, a terrorist plan to blow up the Houses of Parliament and indeed the king uh, and all his court, all at the same time. They gained access to cellars under the Houses of Parliament and packed them with gunpowder. And it was only uncovered at the last minute. One of the conspirators, and we still do not know who, warned his cousin, one of the barons who was due to be at the opening of Parliament that day, the warning was, don't go, because there is danger. Well, of course, that then created a, a stir, and they searched the cellars, and that's when they found Guy Fawkes, and that was the end of the plot, and there were executions and shootouts, and it all ended horribly. Now, you may say, well, that's just a planned terrorist plot, that it was an assassination attempt, and that's all there is to it. But where it becomes a little bit more interesting is, as years have gone on, has been more interest in a very commonly held opinion at the time, which was that they had been sponsored to do it by the very government they thought they were trying to blow up, that they were patsies, that this was very similar to, of course, what we hear about with 9-11 and many other modern plots. So allow me to explain. So there was a Jesuit priest called John Girard, and of course, the Jesuits themselves have been accused of many conspiracies over the years. And they were very persecuted in these times. And here you can see Jean Girard being tortured on the front of one of the books today. He was hung by his hands in the Tower of London. Incredibly, somehow, he managed to escape. He's one of the few people that escaped from the Tower of London, the famous prison. But he, later on, wrote an account of the gunpowder plot where he popularized the idea that the government of the day had, in fact, been behind the plot deliberately to stir hatred against Catholics. And here's one of the lines that he wrote. He said, for purposes of state, the government of the day either found means to instigate the conspirators to undertake their enterprise, or at least being from an early stage of the undertaking, fully aware of what was going on, sedulously nursed the insane scheme till the time came to make capital out of it. So in other words, what he's saying here is the government not only knew about the plot, they sponsored the plot. And indeed, it did create a big persecution that followed against Catholics. And that's why even today in England, we have Bonfire Night every November the 5th that commemorates the plot. But originally, it was intended to create hatred against Catholics. So this notion of patsies being set up, of plots actually being created by the other side to that that you would expect, this has a long and an old history. So moving through the centuries, a little bit later that same century, we then had the Great Fire of London. So we've had the Great Fire of Rome. Well, of course, London had a huge fire in 1666. And bearing in mind that in 1666, that was less than two decades after the English Civil War, that was one of the bloodiest wars in history. To this day, more English people died in that war than in the First and Second World Wars put together. And people do not realize how serious the whole Cromwell versus the King war was. So people were very jittery, and they were looking for people to blame when something went wrong. So naturally, when the fire burned a large proportion of London down, who were they blaming? Well, they found Catholics to blame, of course. And the Jesuits, in particular, were blamed. And there was great hatred against them, even though there is no evidence whatsoever that the Jesuits caused the fire. But into this morass of accusation steps this man here. And this man probably did more damage to the reputation of conspiracy theories in Britain than any other person, though you may not have heard of him. This man is called Titus Oates. He had been a Jesuit priest in training himself, but had then been thrown out. And he had a grudge against the Jesuits. And he and a colleague called Israel Tong uh, decided to invent a plot that would create even more hatred against Catholics. So they spread the idea that the fire had been caused by Catholics. But more, they spread the idea that there was a secret plot to assassinate the new king. 
King Charles II, because, of course, they had executed Charles I. But then the Cromwell years hadn't gone so well as a republic, so they invited the king, the new king, to come back. So Oates said there was a huge plot to kill King Charles, and it got more and more elaborate. The stories he told were more and more crazy, but they were believed. And there were 30 people executed on the back of his claims until finally they started to get wilder and wilder. And then he started to say things like the plot was to assassinate Charles II with silver bullets to inflict an unhealable wound. And it became more and more strange and esoteric until finally the judges twigged, hang on a minute, this bloke is nuts. (laughs) And it was uncovered that it was all a lie. Too late by then. And yet, then Titus Oates found himself in the stocks. He was eventually pardoned later on, but that's another story. The problem we have here is that because it was a conspiracy theory that was widely believed, but turned out provably to be untrue, it did great damage. And after that, although conspiracy theories would never go away in the British Isles or anywhere, they certainly were never believed by the mainstream establishment ever again. And, you know, one of the problems we have is that the mainstream will not acknowledge today conspiracies unless they are uncovered so provably. And then, when they do get uncovered, they reclassify them. Suddenly, they're not conspiracy theories. Suddenly, they're corruption or crime, corporate crime. But, in essence, they are conspiracies. But this did damage, and that may explain why, ever after, conspiracy theory went underground and it was never so publicly discussed again. But that doesn't mean that conspiracies went away, of course. So one of the famous sort of basic sort of weights of conspiracy theory today is talk of the Illuminati. Well, the true Illuminati were a Bavarian secret society formed again in 1776, a lot of Masonic stuff going on there. And there was an attempt to create a secret society that would be very powerful and gain lots of power. Now, the truth is the original Illuminati were, in fact, persecuted and outlawed very quickly. And within 20 years, they were officially no more. But, of course, many people today believe that they did continue secretly, or at least their ideas and plots were then taken up by other people and spread more widely. And that is why when you hear talk of global conspiracy, people will often say it's the Illuminati. Well, it may be or it may not be. It doesn't really matter what you call them. It's the same idea of a small group of people having great power and also believing in occult symbolism. The power of occult symbolism is incredibly important to them. And we will come back to that a little bit later on. So you can see as the years go by, the basic roots of modern conspiracy theory have been there for an awful long time. But when you come to the beginning of the 20th century, you then begin to see what we today call the New World Order plot come more into focus. There is a belief in some areas that the the term New World Order is a conspiracy theorist construct and that there was never any such thing. Well, there was. There was a New World Order plot, and you can prove where its roots lie. Now, one of your speakers last year was a man called Terry Boardman, and he's written a very good book about the origins of the New World Order. And I'll quote Terry here, because he's an interesting researcher. The man on the left here is Arthur Balfour, a very influential British politician who would eventually become the British Prime Minister. And in 1909, Balfour wrote to the President of America, Theodore Roosevelt, and proposed this, and and Terry puts it the best. He proposed that they create a global Anglo-Saxon confederation that would police the world with the navies of the two countries and through their invincible domination bring eternal peace and prosperity. And this is the roots of the New World Order project. Originally, it was certainly Britain and America with the two key components. Now, that has widened out over the years. And, of course, as Britain has lost influence over the years, we've taken a lesser role in it. But that doesn't mean that our part's gone away. And then, of course, other countries have been brought in over the years, although there are many arguments as to whether China and Russia were ever part of it. Many people believe that they were and are not. But the idea of policing the world 
is there. And, of course, this was an idea that was then further advertised and, uh, you know, basically stated what a marvellous idea this was by very famous people. H.G. Wells himself advocated a new world order. The famous philosopher Bertrand Russell advocated a new world order. And more to the point, both of them supported the idea of eugenics. They supported, you know, great suppression of the nations and its peoples for the good of mankind. And if anybody says to you the New World Order was never called that, yes, it was. And H.G. Wells even wrote a book called The New World Order. There are many famous politicians today, although I notice they don't use it so much now, but you know, they would often say, we need to create a new world order. Uh, our ex-Prime Minister Gordon Brown uh, in Britain was one of the best for that. He, there's one speech, look it up on the internet, where he famously says new world order about 20 times within the same speech. So don't say there's no such thing as a new world order as a concept, because there certainly is, and its roots go back a very long way. And it does seem that the idea of a controlling force was already pretty rigidly in place, even by 1913. This is Woodrow Wilson here, who wrote a book in 1913 called The New Freedom. Now, this was shortly before he then became the president. And he makes a very interesting quote, often quoted, but worth repeating again. And in the book, he says this, where he says, some of the biggest men in the United States in the field of commerce and manufacture are afraid of somebody, are afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. Now, there have been arguments over the years as to what he was really referring to, but there are many people in the conspiracy world who believe he is basically describing the ruling elite that were already in place. The irony being, of course, that Wilson himself would very quickly then become a part of that ruling elite, because very shortly after he became the president, as we were hearing from William earlier on, he helped to create the Federal Reserve, the moment where public money was basically corralled and the choices that we had around it were taken away from us, which is creating so many problems to this day. And we don't need to go back in to the areas of how money is used to control things, partly because it is obvious, partly because William has covered it so very well. But nonetheless, you can see the steps that were made here, and sometimes they were steps made by people who previously you would have thought would have been opposed to it. Somewhere down the line, they were bought, they sold their souls for the New World Order project. And as well as controlling money, you have to control the world by other means. And many people, of course, believe conflict is used to create the new world order. And there are, of course, those who believe that both World War I and World War II were deliberately, if not caused, allowed to occur because of the controls it gave to certain individuals and the boost it gave, ultimately, to the new world order project. Here's a good early example of a false flag from the 20th century. Um, you will have heard, perhaps, of the ship, the Lusitania. And the Lusitania had been sailing happily across the Atlantic from America to England. And it was always given a fleet of, uh, of ships, an escort, because, as of course, as World War I began, U-boats, German submarines, were patrolling, and they knew they were a threat. And then, of course, one day, suddenly, it doesn't have any escorts. It's going along the Irish coast, and suddenly all the ships have vanished. And it's vulnerable, and it's alone, and it is torpedoed. And as you can see from this headline here, many, many people died. Over 1,200 people died. Now, this is a curiosity because who gave the order to withdraw the ships? Well, we can't be sure. But it's a fair bet that it would have been the First Lord of the Admiralty. And who was the First Lord of the Admiralty in those days? Sir Winston Churchill, as he is, or was later. Now, of course, this is sacrilege to say this in some areas. To some, Churchill is the big hero of the war. But I'm afraid there is good evidence that he may have given the order to allow the Lusitania to be torpedoed by allowing it to go into unsafe waters without an escort. 
And if you doubt that, it's worth quoting a letter that Churchill wrote. This is on the record. He once said, shortly before that happened, it is most important to attract neutral shipping to our shores in the hope especially of embroiling the United States with Germany. For our part, we want the traffic, the more the better. And if some of it gets into trouble, better still. So in other words, what are you saying here? is we need one of our ships to get into trouble because he particularly wanted the Americans to come on board in the war, which of course they did. Not immediately, but the Lusitania sinking was certainly used for great propaganda. And these posters were very powerful at the time, uh, showing the, the mother and the daughter drowning, coming off the Lusitania with a simple word, enlist. In other words, join up, join the war. And this certainly helped turn public opinion in America towards thinking that maybe they did need to go and fight the war that was occurring then in Europe. So the false flag attack is alive and well, even in more modern times, and of course we will see more. So when you then come into World War II, you see the same patterns on both sides. It is an interest to me that, of course, it is often said that the Reichstag fire uh, in 1933, which enabled the then rising Nazi party to gain a lot more control because they blamed the fire on the communists and of course then the communists lost what positions they had and then the Nazi party was able to rise to its full power, which previously it didn't have quite enough seats to do everything it wanted. After this, yes it did. But it's interesting to me how even the mainstream establishment seems to accept the likelihood that the Nazis did it themselves. When in fact there are ambiguities around that. We do know that a Dutch communist, Marinus de Luba, was involved with the fire. But of course there are many claims that there were Nazi officers who were also involved. But whatever the truth, it is generally accepted in the mainstream that the Nazis did it themselves. That it was a false flag. And yet, when you then say, well, yes, well, maybe 9-11 was, was an inside job, no. Now, they can't go there. They can say it about the Nazis, but they can't say it about the regimes that we have in power today. And then, of course, as the World War II had then begun and then uh, things hotted up, then you get a very similar situation to, Pearl, uh, to Lusitania with the Pearl Harbor attack. Now, it is almost a bit sort of a cliche to say Pearl Harbor was a false flag attack, and yet the evidence is pretty strong that at the very least, intelligence messages that there was going to be an attack were ignored. There are more claims from insiders that say more than that, the Japanese were deliberately antagonized into creating the attack, and that they basically then let the defenses down and let them come in for similar reasons. Because this gentleman here, who was the then President Roosevelt, a cousin of Theodore Roosevelt, uh, again, and I'm oversimplifying here, there are of course always more complexities to all of these stories, but in essence he was willing for America to join the war. A lot of corporate people in America were not. There was a lot of business ties with Germany, it was very awkward. But after Pearl Harbor was attacked, it changed American public opinion. There had been attack on their own territory, as it were, and that changed things. And now, there are some patriots today who say, this is disgusting nonsense. How dare you say that this could have happened? Well, here's the interesting thing. It isn't just conspiracy theorists who believed that Pearl Harbor was allowed to occur. Some of the people at the time in high positions believed it. Uh, Jonathan Daniels was one of the secretaries of Roosevelt, and he made a very interesting comment where he said the blow, meaning Pearl Harbor, the blow was heavier than he had hoped it would necessarily be. But the risks paid off, even the loss was worth the price, clearly referring to the fact that this was a setup. And if you want something more direct, let's have another person at the time who believed that this was false flag. Vice Admiral Libby said, I will go to my grave convinced that FDR, Roosevelt, ordered Pearl Harbor to let happen. He must have known. So when people say this is mad conspiracy theory, do remember to refer them to people who were part of the Navy at the time because they suspected something was up. So you must, of course, make up your own minds about this, but you can see there are repeating patterns going on here, and we cannot ignore them. 
And of course, at the end of the war, we then see the next stage in what seems to be the New World Order, and then laying the grounds for the Cold War, which of course, you know, did so many things to create centralized power, not to mention create a lot of money for the arms industry. And by this point, you know, England, or Britain, I should say, were on the back foot in the New World Order. They'd lost a lot of money, they'd lost a lot of power because of the, the World War. And suddenly America really stepped, I think, into the main driving seat of the New World Order. And yet, as we will see later on, it is clear that Britain is still looked to as a necessary component. And I think there are underlying links which are still very powerful for people today. So you can see how conflicts and wars are very important to create a mandate for control and centralized power. And as the decades rolled on, this never really went away. One of the most famous uh, discussed false flag incidents, if you want to call it that, isn't really false flag. The Gulf of Tonkin incident is often said it was really the, the final flashpoint that generated the Vietnam War, except that instead of it being false flag, in fact, the, the Gulf of Tonkin incident never really occurred. There were minor skirmishes. Here we are, you can see there was a couple of North Vietnamese gunboats that came down and took the occasional pot shot at this huge American fleet. They were no threat to the fleet. But one night, there were sonar readings that suggested a big North Vietnamese fleet were coming in. And so the American warships started pounding their guns, opening fire, until they realized within a matter of hours it was a mistake you can have what they call sonar errors. They were ghosts. There was no fleet coming. And the Americans knew this. And the sailors, who had, of course, you know, initially been reporting back to the White House, had said, we are under attack. But then they said, with plenty of time for decisions to be changed, they said, no, it didn't happen. It was our mistake. We were not under attack. But guess what? The American government failed to say that to anybody. And instead, Robert McNamara shows to the world's press how the Gulf of Tonkin incident was this evil attack on the American warships. And off the back of this, of course, we had the beginnings of the Vietnam War. And this gentleman here was uh, a big, of course, decision maker being the president. So here we have Lyndon B. Johnson. And you will see Mr. Johnson pops up a couple of times in the world of conspiracy theory because unfortunately he seems to be associated with quite a lot of conspiracies and he certainly knew that there had been no attack. It is almost certain that he knew that but he still decided to use it as a basis to generate of course one of the most terrible wars of the 20th century and you all know the rest on that. So conflicts sometimes are helped along by false flag attacks other times, they are helped along by plain lies, simply lies. Don't even need to stage an attack when you can just say one has occurred. Very clever, much cheaper as well, although not in the long run. Now, another war that we had going on around the same time is worth a mention. Now, the Six-Day War of 1967, cutting a very long story short, was where Israel was getting more and more threatened by its neighbors and things were getting bad. But Israel decided to launch a preemptive strike against them. Now this was not expected. And in fact, it was very successful because hence the title Six Days War, six days later Israel had effectively won the conflict. But the incident that is often quoted in the conspiracy world from this war is the USS Liberty incident. Now, I'm still astonished how few people often seem to know about this, so this is worth a mention. Many people think this is a failed attempt at a false flag attack. During the conflict, the USS Liberty was monitoring signals. Remember, the Americans were allies, of course, of the Israelis, but they remained neutral. They were not directly involved in that conflict. So why was it then that one day, uh, Israeli warplanes and Israeli torpedo boats came up to the American ship, the Liberty, and started firing at it and attempted to sink it. Now this is something you could spend a whole two hours on, so I'm cutting a very long story short here. The general view is this, that this was an attempt to make it look like Egypt had attacked the American uh, ship because 
here's the interesting thing. Of course, again, they wanted, the Israelis wanted, it would seem, America to come in fully into the war. Some say it was even an attempt to trigger World War III, you know, inflate it to create the big New World Order plot. There are other possibilities. Some say the Israelis did this to stop the Americans monitoring signals that told of atrocities occurring on the mainland. And there are some gray areas, but one thing is not gray, which is the Israelis absolutely knew this ship was American and not Egyptian, as they claimed. And the torpedo boats were so near, there's no way they could not have seen that it was an American ship. It had American flags. It was an American ship. And there's a lot of evidence to say they knew very well it was American. So why was it that they then said, oh, we're ever so sorry, we attacked it because we thought it was Egyptian when they knew that it was not? And you can see here they even managed to torpedo the hull, but it didn't sink. Now this, I think, created problems because, of course, had it sunk without trace, all hands dead, there would be nobody to testify that, in fact, it was the Israelis that did it. And this was problematic. And it was embarrassing even, it would seem, to this man here, Mr. Lyndon B. Johnson. Now, when told that his own, one of his own ships was under attack, you would imagine that he would want somebody to go and help that ship. But when he heard that planes had been dispatched to go and rescue it because it was under attack, here is what he reportedly said. He said, no, I want that goddamn ship going to the bottom. No help. Recall the wings. Because he also knew it would seem that if the Liberty was still afloat, that was going to create major international embarrassment. There is still a campaign today from the survivors. Around 30, 40 men died on that ship, but the survivors are still campaigning for truth, saying they absolutely knew they were American. They were sacrificed for some attempted false flag that for some reason went wrong. Why didn't it sink? Why didn't the people firing the missiles go all out? There are many things. If you read the book, Conspiracies, I write much more about this because I realize I am simplifying here. But nonetheless, you can see it's another unfolding pattern here of false flag attacks. Now talking of questionable American presidents, we have of course to just mention briefly Richard Nixon because the Watergate affair is something that is not really seen as that big a deal in the conspiracy world. It's written off as being a bit of sort of espionage between political parties but of course there is actually much more to the story than that. And here's the interesting thing. So for those of you that still don't really know what Watergate was about, in essence, in essence, there was a burglary in these buildings here, the Watergate offices. So it was the Democratic National Committee headquarters. And some Republicans broke in. Now, we still are not clear, although I'll give you one possibility in a moment, we are not clear why they broke in, but they were looking for papers, they were looking for information of some kind, and they were discovered, and they were caught, and it was clear that this was not going to be able to be covered up. But of course, where Nixon got himself into trouble was that he did attempt to cover it up. Now, some have accused Nixon of giving the order for the burglary. That is still not settled. We don't know that. But we do know that he attempted to cover up the fact that Republicans have been involved. However, he then undid himself because he had installed in the White House a series of tape recorders that, unbeknown to many of the people in the White House, were recording every conversation that was going on. So, of course, when this then finally was uh, made public, these tapes were sequestered. It was ordered that these tapes be given to the judges to hear what was on it. And, of course, there was very damning evidence on it that Nixon at the least knew that there was an attempt to cover up. And that's really what damned him, rather than the burglar itself. And it's interesting to note that maybe more might have been revealed. But the 18 most crucial minutes on the tape, guess what? were accidentally wiped by this lady here, uh, Nixon's secretary, Rosemary Woods. Apparently an accident, but interesting that a lot of people wonder what's, what was on that 18 minutes. So, maybe it could have been worse, but either way, it saw the end for Nixon. So, you may say, it's not that big a deal. How does this link in with anything else? Well, it does perhaps. Because Nixon resigned, of course, and then that seemed to be that. But these two gentlemen here are just two people who were involved in committing the Watergate burglary. 
Now, Frank Sturgis and E. Howard Hunt are controversial figures, and we will never know who's quite telling the truth, but they were certainly part of the burglary, and they claimed that the reason they were going into Watergate was, in fact, to try to retrieve damning evidence that implicated them and various later administrations in the assassination of, guess who? Kennedy. Now, there are, of course, counterclaims, and some people say Hunt and Sturgis are liars, but it's interesting because some people have even in, uh, implicated Sturgis and Hunt as being some of the additional gunmen that, of course, some people believe were present at the shooting of Kennedy. So here we are, 50 years later. We're still discussing it. We still can't really get to the bottom of it. And I'm not going to rake through the Kennedy assassination stuff again, but it's interesting how the Watergate breaking has links to this, and it may, therefore, have been much more important than it first meets the eye. Well, you know the details of what happened to Kennedy. We don't need to go through the gruesome, horrible shooting details. But... It is, of course, now the classic sort of line, the lone gunman theory, because this is where things divide. Because if you say there was only one man, and that's the official view, well, kind of the official view, as you'll see in a minute, not quite. But the official view is that Lee Harvey Oswald was the sole gunman. And that's kind of nice and easy, an assassination attempt. You will already know, especially if you've seen Oliver Stone's JFK, which in itself is not entirely accurate, but it makes a good point. There are many questions about the bullets that hit not only President Kennedy, but Governor Connolly. A lot of people say one gunman could not have inflicted this much uh, damage. So this is the problem that we have. However... And here's the interesting thing. Of course, if you then say there are more gunmen, you've got to say there was a wider conspiracy. So that's when you get into all the cliches about the grassy knoll. The grassy knoll, here we see it, is simply a rise of grass where there were people who claimed there were other gunmen firing from above the wall. The arguments still rage today. But if you say there were other gunmen, then you've got to say it wasn't just one madman, that there were many other people, or at least one other person involved, and why and who were they working for? And then it becomes more complex. And we might have found out more about this, of course, were it not for the fact that Oswald was then himself shot dead by Jack Ruby. Oswald was being moved from the police station, Jack Ruby steps out, shoots him in the stomach. So we never heard Oswald's side of the story. But Jack Ruby himself is an interesting character. So Ruby, of course, gets arrested himself, and his claim was he was a nightclub owner, he was a patriot, and he was getting his own back for the people against this lone gunman. But it's not quite that simple, because I think it's clear that Jack Ruby expected to be let off for this crime because it was a patriotic act, but he wasn't. And when he began to realise he wasn't going to be released and he was going to go the full suffering route, he then began to come out with more information. And by the time he'd been in prison for a little while, he had himself become a conspiracy theorist. And here's an interesting quote from Jack Ruby. There was a press conference where he was able to be interviewed And he said this, he said, everything pertaining to what's happening has never come to the surface. The world will never know the true facts of what occurred, my motives. The people who had so much to gain and had such an ulterior motive for putting me in the position I'm in will never let the true facts come above board to the world. And then a reporter said, are these people in very high positions, Jack? And then he said, yes. So in other words, it would seem that he believes that he was kind of framed, although there's no question that he then shot Oswald, I mean, but he was framed as the sole perpetrator. Now, later on, he then claimed that people in his cell were injecting him with cancer cells, and he did indeed die of cancer in the police cells eventually. So, we will never know his side of the story. But you see, the problem we have here is that Ruby and Oswald, far from being enemies, may in fact have been friends. Uh, Ruby was a nightclub owner. One of his strippers was this lady here, seen in her younger years here, uh, Rose Chirami. Now, she had gone to the police on the eve of the shooting of JFK to warn them that there was a plot because she had overheard Oswald and Ruby, who she claims were lovers, she had overheard them discussing the plot to kill Kennedy. 
But of course she was not believed, and then of course the shooting occurred, uh, and she was then given a very hard time later on as a liar, a fantasist, she'd made it all up. Well, maybe she did, but then more people took her seriously when she was found dead by the side of a road a couple of years later. And it certainly seems that they wanted to shut her up. There are many other witnesses, many other complexities to this that we could talk about. But I will just say this, in a little series that we'll have now, in the next half an hour to the end, JFK, the number of key witnesses who have died in mysterious circumstances is always worth noting if you want to get to the root of what's going on. Okay, what have we got here? Total, 21 in mysterious, weird circumstances, too much to really be coincidence. Note this, because we're going to see some other mysterious deaths as we go through. So, listen, I am simplifying here. You could go on forever about Kennedy and still not come to an agreement. It may interest you, however, to know that, in fact, the official line is that there probably were other gunmen. Realising that the Warren Commission, that was very hastily set up and concluded there was only one gunman, realising that that was not convincing the public, in 1979, the administration at the time then reopened the investigation and produced this report, the Select Committee on Assassinations, and it concluded that there probably were other gunmen. But guess what? It then failed to follow it up, and it was like, that'll do and they never went any further. And the absolute truth is that the official view says there was a wider conspiracy. Who was it? Make your minds up, really. So many options. But a lot of people think whoever it was that actually organized it, whether it was Cuban exiles, Fidel Castro, the Mafia, the Freemasons, the Israelis, MJ-12, whoever, doesn't really matter that it was all working ultimately for the New World Order project, that Kennedy needed to be removed. It was a coup. And of course, because it was a coup, everything that's come since has basically created more control. Kennedy was a bit of a wild card. He wasn't playing the game. He wasn't axing on the orders of the masters. He wasn't doing what he was told to do. So he had to go. And of course, uh, guess who some people implicate as being uh, one of the key people who helped organize it, our friend Mr. Johnson again. We can't prove this, but this is conspiracy theory in this case, and there's certainly evidence that he may well have been caught up with all of this. And then, of course, some years later, what happens? Kennedy's brother goes the same way, gunned down in a Los Angeles hotel. The same year, Martin Luther King dies. Um, that was... I think an interesting turning point in the public psyche, because by now conspiracy theories were rife. And by now, of course, it seemed that anybody that stood up for themselves and for good and right was just going to end up getting shot down. And it began to create a kind of feeling that anybody that was trying to stand up tall would be cut down. And it then began to create conspiracy theories that went into rather surreal zones. So, around 1969, a little conspiracy theory grew on American student radio. And it grew and it grew, and it's still going on today. And you may not have even heard about it. And it's not seen as that serious by some, and yet for others it is. There is a theory that Paul McCartney of the Beatles, the real Paul McCartney, died in a car accident in 1966 and that he was replaced by a look-alike, a double, who ever after took his place and happened to write even better songs. Now, I am not in any way saying this is true, but what's important is that this theory was believed by millions around the world, latched onto by millions around the world. And here's the thing. People then began to say, well, you know what? What happened was he died, and the rest of the Beatles, they didn't want their career ruined at that point, so they hid the evidence that he died, got a double in, but they couldn't help themselves leaving clues on their record sleeves. And here's where it begins to get rather odd. Because if you look at the record sleeves, there's kind of odd signals that single out Paul McCartney. For instance, in the Magical Mystery Tour, the ballroom sequence, Paul McCartney wears a black carnation. The others wear red. Maybe coincidence? 
Then you got, there's a lot of conspiracy theory around the cover of Abbey Road, their last proper album, where this is said to be a symbolic funeral procession. And Paul is the only one not wearing shoes or socks, which in some cultures are seen as evidence of the dead man. So for some, this is meaningful. Uh, there are many other things. On several of their covers, there's a hand reaching out over the head of Paul McCartney. Now, in some cultures, again, that's sort of like you're marking them out, going up to heaven. And what is really odd, if anybody here has the White Album, or The Beatles, their 1968 double album, if you listen to Revolution Number no. 9, it's a very strange sound collage. There is a voice that says number nine, number nine, number nine. If you play it backwards, funnily enough, and it's true, and I can't play it to you here, but I can show you it, it says, turn me on, dead man, turn me on, dead man. Now, is that a mere coincidence? Of course, many would say it is. But then it gets weirder, because some clues seem like too much coincidence. The front cover of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, their most famous album, has this drum kit on it. Now, I don't know who ever thought to do this, but one day, in the way of the conspiracy theories erupting, somebody thought, what happens if you put a mirror up on the drum? And when you do, it's really interesting. You put the mirror up, and it reads, One, he die, with Roman numerals in between, which is supposed to give the date of his real death. Is that chance? Is this some mad coincidence? Or is this a real clue? Or is it just somebody in the record company thinking we'll have a laugh here? There's all these nutters who think McCartney's dead, so we'll drop some clues in and make it seem like he is. And certainly it sold a lot of records. It is said that the Beatles' record sales went through the roof when this theory went viral, as we would today call it. But you can see here how by the end of the 60s, people were getting jittery. And they were beginning to believe in conspiracy theories that seemed very outlandish. And then shortly after a while, it seemed that you could question anything and everything. And people did. And of course, one of the most famous conspiracy theories of all is the theory that maybe we never really went to the moon. Now this seems, at first glance, mad. But is it? Here's the problem. Because of everything that happened with Nixon and the Kennedy assassination and Luther King and blah, 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 there was no trust anymore in authority. So for some people, when the US authorities announced they'd been to the moon, there was a feeling of, well, how can we be sure? And it took a few years to build, but it's still building. There was a poll taken in Britain for the 40th anniversary of the moon landings where it said that 25% of British people no longer believe we've been to the moon. That's an enormous amount of people. So you could dismiss it and say, well, that's mad, but it is interesting. Okay, it's interesting because we've got three pieces of evidence that we went to the moon. Number one, you've got the astronauts' testimony, but they could be lying. You can't be sure. They might be lying under oath or under threat. So what else have we got? Your moon rock. But moon rock could have been retrieved by automated probes. Doesn't prove we stood there. So what really do you have? You've got the photographs. So the photographs are better stand up to some very good scrutiny. But they don't, often. And this is where a grey area comes in, where it's hard to be sure what's really going on. So people say there are anomalies that prove they were taken in the studio and not on the moon. So here is one of the most famous pictures of all time. Buzz Aldrin standing on the moon as taken by Neil Armstrong, who you can just see reflected in the helmet there. But there are problems. Now one of the problems is this. Clearly the, the main light source, presumably the sun, is coming from behind. It's casting a jet black shadow. That's fine. And yet he is very well lit up. Oh, that's a bit odd, because if that shadow was jet black, you would imagine he would be in silhouette too. Now, there's a few answers to this, possibly. One is that you raise the exposure of the camera, okay? And then you would get the light on his body like that, but then it would reveal detail in the shadow. Well, that's funny, because there isn't any. 
The official view is that this is reflected light. It's light bouncing off the surface from the moon's surface onto him. But in fact, the moon has a very low albedo, which means re reflectivity. It re it's about the same color of tarmac, despite the brightness it looks like in some of these uh, pictures. And even if that were true, again, well, why isn't there enough light to light up the shadow with detail? It's not just this picture. It's many pictures have the same anomaly. And then you look at the light source, which we are told is the sun. There's a very, very bright spot here, but then it starts to fall off into shadow in the far distance. It comes into shadow even three or four feet earlier on. How can that be natural sunlight? It shouldn't have a spot of light. And many people say this is a spotlight. Now, this could all be easily remedied by saying they used artificial lighting on the moon. They put up a spotlight just to help. That would be okay, but they say they didn't. And so we have a serious anomaly. Another anomaly in the shot, and many others, is this. The horizon line passes very neatly through his helmet. But that's wrong, because you can see Neil Armstrong, when you zoom in, is taking this with a camera strapped to the chest. And anybody can calculate easily, and many have, the horizon line, therefore, should be here, going through his middle. How can it be up here? And you can calculate the camera was being held about five, six feet up looking down and therefore was not taken by Neil Armstrong, who we see reflected in the visor. This is a problem we see in many of the shots. There's another horizon problem, and yet it's been taken by a camera down here. The cameras were strapped to the chest. They never looked through them. They never lifted them up. They couldn't. There was no viewfinder. They couldn't look through them. They were simply hoping they would all come out perfectly, and funnily enough, most of them did. <laughs> and one more thing to say as well, here's another shadow anomaly. Um, these cameras had very little protection against radiation or light and heat. Back in the 60s, you may remember if you tried to take a piece of film through an airport scanner, it might come out cloudy. Well, that's radiation on the moon. There's masses of radiation. So there are two schools of thought. Some say we never went. The radiation was too much. They had to fake the whole thing. Others people say we went, but none of the films came out. They were too fogged. The light and the heat ruined them. So there are halfway houses you can take. There is another school of thought that says what we found on the moon was unshowable. Remember, Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell has gone on record saying they saw evidence of extraterrestrials on the moon. There's an astronaut saying this. Maybe they couldn't show the truth of what they found. But the problem is, all of that you could sweep aside were it not for the anomalies that are very obvious. I mean, here's a shot of the lunar lander. The sun, apparently, behind it there. Jet black shadow on the ground, fair enough. Look how brightly it's lit up. I mean, the astronaut's glowing. That's not reflected light, and you can prove it's not, because if it was, you would see the light bouncing off here. Now, when you zoom in, and you can do this on the internet yourself, very high-resolution shots available, you can see the lights coming in from the side, and you get little bright reflective spots. It's artificial lighting, end of the story. But they say they didn't use any, and that's the problem. Another little problem is also that there's very little evidence of any scarring or crater underneath any of the six lunar landers in all the pictures. Now, that's a bit odd, because it came down on several thousand pounds worth of thrust, but there's no evidence that that occurred. Now, even if they cut the motors a little bit high up, it should still have disturbed the surface. Let me give you a comparison. Recently, we had the Mars rover, the Curiosity rover. It was lowered down from a platform that was hovering about 60, 70 feet up. And the hovering, look, it scarred the surface of Mars very, very visibly. And yet on the moon, nothing. Not even any disturbance of dust. The feet, I mean, it's like somebody's vacuumed them, you know? Compare that to another Mars lander, the Phoenix lander from a few years ago. Dirt, dust on the feet, as you would imagine. It's the same for all the lunar missions. And therein hangs the problem. Now, here's another little issue about the jets. When you see the lunar landers take off, and the automatic camera follows them up, that's fair enough, okay? You see the explosive bolts go off, up it goes. 
problem. This is going up on several thousand pounds worth of thrust. But there's nothing, there's no glow, there's nothing. Now you might say, well, you wouldn't see it in a vacuum. Yes, you would. Why? Because exactly the same fuel was used in the space shuttle. And when the space shuttle fires its thrusters, you see it. We're told it's the same fuel, but funnily enough, there's no sign of anything on the moon. It's like it's lifting up on a crane. And that's exactly what some people say it is doing. The problem we have is there are provable NASA fakes. Okay, that's the problem. There are some provable fakes. Here is golf being played on the moon by Stuart Rooster and another astronaut on Apollo 14, except it's been proven to be a fake and accepted as a fake. You can find all the different components they put together. There was no camera standing here. Who took the picture? There was no automatic facility. You can see from the other shots, there's nothing here. It's a fake photograph. And one of the other killers, if you've not seen this before, this is great. Michael Collins here, spacewalking from Gemini 10 in the uh, mid-60s. Uh, well, at least we thought it was until some while later, somebody was looking through the NASA image bank and they discover this photograph of Michael Collins in a test aeroplane. And it's clear what has occurred. They have cut him out, stuck him on a black background, and said, hey, look, he's in space. <laughs> it's that bad. Now, the problem is, of course, if, if you fake one or two pictures, well, why not 100 or 200, or why not all of them? Why well, should we believe them? And that's the problem. I am not saying we didn't go to the moon, but I am saying there are problems with the evidence. There are aerial shots showing the landers and that, allegedly, but then Photoshop's very good these days, till we get back there and literally land and see all the things in the same place with the same lighting conditions, we're not going to be sure. But here is where the tale gets a bit darker. It isn't just people in the more conspiracy-laden days since that were thinking this wasn't going to work. Here we see on the left Virgil Grissom, Gus Grissom as he was known. He should have been the first man on the moon. There's a reason why he wasn't. He was very dubious that this mission was going to work. He criticized the technology to the point where at a press conference in front of journalists, he hung a lemon on the capsule as an insulting symbol. And he said, I think our chances of getting to the moon are very slim. That's, that's what he said, very slim. And he started, he claimed, to receive death threats. And he made an interesting quote to his wife shortly before... He said, if there is ever a serious accident in the space program, it's likely to be me. Well, what happened? Of course, a short while after, he was one of the three that died in the launch pad fire of Apollo 1. And Apollo 1 caught fire on the launch pad during training, and they died rather horribly. They were in a very oxygen-rich atmosphere. It was very ill-advised, number one. So a lot of people think this was sabotage. And certainly there were people at the time within NASA who believed it was sabotage. And Grissom's son, Scott Grissom, who was himself, he then became an aerospace engineer, also is convinced that his father was murdered. Scott Grissom demanded to see the capsule many years later in which his father died. He wanted to investigate. He didn't feel there'd been a proper investigation. When he investigated, finally he was allowed to look, he discovered a small metal plate that obviously at some point had been inserted into a little place deliberately made for it in the dashboard, in the cockpit of the capsule that could serve no function other than to cause a fire. It, it served no function. It would have just created a spark. And in an oxygen-rich atmosphere, whoomph, you wouldn't stand a chance. And as we were saying in conversation earlier on, also... The hatch, which normally should be very easy to open and get out, was sealed shut like they couldn't get out. So he went public saying, my father was murdered. But that was really known at the time, because a NASA investigator shortly after the fire, this man here, Thomas Ronald Barham, was asked to investigate the fire, but he didn't come up with the right answers, because he concluded it was sabotage, and then he concluded also that just looking at the general state of the technology, it was very unlikely we were going to get to the moon. He was preparing a 500-page report. He'd made a preliminary. That's how we know what he believed. Uh, but guess what? One day, he and his family were in the car, 
and he mysteriously drove it directly into a train, and they all died. And anybody after that who was going to start questioning it probably went rather quiet. So I'm afraid there is a darker side to this. So another little game here. Not very funny one. NASA, number of key personnel who have died in mysterious circumstances. Thirteen. So I think it is clear that even though it seems like a silly conspiracy theory, there are people who take it more seriously at the top who don't want the truth to come out. And that's where you have to consider, hang on a minute, there's more to the story. Talking of strange deaths, okay, let's leap forward. It is interesting to me that if you look at the polls about the people's belief in why Princess Diana died, in Britain, certainly, it is around 90% of people believe she was murdered. You can have inquest after inquest saying, no, it was a drunk driver. No one really believes that in their gut. There's a strong feeling that she was murdered. You probably know the story of Diana. So after the split with Charles, she decided to get her own back. She went very public, did lots of interviews, very damning. She revealed things about the royal family we weren't meant to know. And then, of course, one night, being chased by paparazzi photographers, the car slams into the wall of the underpass in Paris, and they all die. She didn't die immediately. We'll come back to that point in just a moment. So the problem we have is the official verdict says it was basically a drunk driver. The driver, Henri Paul, seen here on CCTV, is not in any of the footage seen to be drunk or in any way out of control of his own faculties. And the, it is acknowledged that the blood sample that they claim proves he was drunk had been switched. It got switched accidentally. They claim they switched it back and they did a double test and he definitely was drunk. But the interesting thing is that those same results reveal that if he was drunk, he had so much other toxicity in his body, he would have been too ill to even have got out of bed that day. There's something very odd about that sample, and yet you can see from the footage all was normal. There are many things you can say here. This has all erupted again in the press in Britain in the last few weeks because the wife of an ex-SAS officer has gone public saying the SAS murdered Diana. So this is now coming all back to the surface again. One of the problems we have is that it is known and accepted that a white Fiat clipped the Mercedes in the tunnel. But the French authorities, funnily enough, with cameras all over Paris, say they never found the Fiat. <laughs> Couldn't trace it. Too many cameras turned off that night. Interesting, isn't it? Well, when Mohammed al-Fayed, who I accept some people do not take seriously, but hey, his son had just died in the crash, Dodi, so he's going to have a vested interest in knowing what happened. When he put his own private detectives on it, they found the very likely owner of the Fiat, this man, James Andanson. Now, Andanson claimed that he hadn't used the Fiat in some years, and it wasn't him. But odd it was then that a little while later, Andanson was found dead in another burnt-out car. But here's the thing. There were two bullet holes in his skull, and he had been decapitated. And the official inquest said it was suicide. <laughs> i leave you to think about that for a moment. This doesn't make sense plainly. And yet, this never got properly investigated. Diana certainly thought she was in danger. She, let us not forget, and most people don't remember this, she believed her bodyguard, Barry Manneke, who died in a motorcycle accident some years before, she believed he had been murdered because it is said she probably had an affair with him and the intelligence services wanted him out the way. So she believed in conspiracy theory, absolutely. And lest we forget, she told her then butler, Paul Burrell, and her confidant, Lord Mishcon, that there was a plot to kill her. She'd gone public with this, and the letters are ever so revealing. You may remember them. Here's one written by the princess herself. And she says, cutting some of this out, she says, this particular phase in my life is the most dangerous. My husband is planning an accident in my car, brake failure and serious head injury in order to make the path clear for him to marry Tiggy. Ah, your thought was going to say Camilla, didn't you? 
She didn't believe that. She believed that Charles wanted to marry the nanny of uh, William and Harry, Tiggy Leg Burke. And where Camilla fits into this is another question. Uh, it may interest you to know there was an attempt to run Camilla Parker Bowles off the road, which some people think was another assassination attempt to get rid of her. And it didn't work. And with that not having worked, they then bumped off Diana instead. And somewhere down the line, Tiggy didn't get away, and he wound up marrying Camilla. It's very complex, but there's more to the story than meets the eye. That is for absolute certain. And, of course, by the end of her career, she was campaigning against landmines. Well, I'm sure you can imagine how the arms manufacturers felt about that, and especially given that Dodi al mother was Mrs. Koshogi, and the Koshogi family are some of the biggest arms manufacturers in the world. They probably didn't want her at their dinner table, thank you very much. You have to take your pick as to who may have given the orders, because there seem to be people queuing up to get rid of her. I mean, of course, the other one is that she was in a relationship with Dodi al -Fayed. Some have said, well, the British royal family could not tolerate a Muslim bloodline mixing in. Although she had gone out with a Muslim before, uh, Adnet Khan, of course, nobody has seen to have had a fuss about that. And then, of course, Mohammed al fayed believes Prince Philip himself gave the orders to kill her. Well, the answer is we don't know. But I think it is likely, when you look at the evidence, that it was a murder. Here's the last piece of evidence. When she was found in the car, she was in fact not dead. And she was still alive when they took her back to the hospital, this hospital here. It's just interesting that it is known that you had French doctors tending to her. They expected her to survive. Then the British doctors turn up. And they say, don't worry, we'll take everything from here. Out you go. Cleared the French doctors out of the room, shut the door, and she was dead within about 20 minutes. And when they announced she was dead, no one could believe it. So why is she dead? She shouldn't be dead. There was one of the doctors who was going to write a book about this and go public. Guess what happened to him? Died in a mysterious car crash before the book came out. And I'm afraid when you look at the pattern of people who have died in mysterious circumstances, it's the same thing again and again. Dr. David Kelly, a UN weapons inspector, of course, was very famous when he said during the raging Iraq war, there were no weapons of mass destruction. And then, of course, he was mysteriously found dead shortly after having testifying had testified to the government. He was shortly found dead in woods near his home. The problem we have is... The wounds that we are told were suicide wounds couldn't possibly have killed him. He had very little drugs in his body. They couldn't have killed him. His body was provably moved from where it was originally found to where the police filmed him. As he was slumped up against a tree. The police photographs show him sprawled like that with a knife and a bottle of water next to him, as if to make it look more like a suicide. Even one of our members of parliament, Norman Baker, wrote a book saying Kelly was murdered. So when MPs start saying that, you really know there's something very wrong with the story. And if you want the absolute evidence of that, bear in mind the official inquiry, which would you believe was a whitewash. Lord Hutton, who led it, uh, decreed that the medical records that apparently proved that it was suicide could not be released for 70 years. If that ain't suspicious, I don't know what. And plus... The coroner's certificate that declared why he died. Now, the whole point of the inquest was to decide how he died. Bear in mind, only three days into the inquest that went on for a long while, the coroner suddenly produces the certificate that says, yes, it was suicide, thus making a whole joke of the inquest and skewing the verdict of the, in of the inquest. So it's very clear, again, look at the polls. In England, 90% of people believe Kelly was murdered. And of course, all of that, the war in Iraq, and all of that was a spin-off from the war on terror, the campaign in Afghanistan, and all of that, of course, was a spin-off from, guess what, 9-11. And I hardly need to say anything about this, and I'm barely going to say anything, except to say that a lot of people think this was the biggest New World Order coup in history. But here's something some of you may not know. It was not the first attempt Go back in time to 1993. There was a truck bomb that went off in the basement of the World Trade Center. And when it went off, 
It killed several people and injured thousands, and it nearly took out the foundations, which would have toppled one tower into the other and brought them both down. Here's the curious thing. A, that is clearly a sign that somebody was trying to get rid of the towers even back then. And B, this man, Imad Salem, claimed he worked for the FBI. And he claimed that the jihadist group that apparently carried this out were known to the FBI, and he had been hired to basically set them up, a bit like the gunpowder plot, set them up so that they could step in at the last minute and prevent the bombing, but of course implicate the Muslim world. But, funnily enough, they were supposed to have been given dummy explosives. They were going to give them fake explosives that they wouldn't have known so that they could then be caught. But guess what? They gave them real explosives. Now, of course, the authorities say, this man is a fantasist and a liar, but it fits in pretty well with other things that we know about 9-11. You don't need me to say very much here. If you believe the official story of 9-11, you need to find out more, and I'm sure most of you don't. Mr. Rockefeller, we haven't mentioned him, so let's mention him here and now. The classic quote, he once said, all we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. And for many people, this was really the crisis, because so much has spun off from it. And take your pick, whether it's the size of the hole in the Pentagon, clear evidence for some kind of explosive, a building that falls down when it wasn't hit by anything, and what seems to be molten metal when the temperatures couldn't ever have been that high. Well, we could go on. Whether you believe it was conventional thermite or you want to go down the Dr. Judy Wood route that says there was some other weird technology involved, does it matter? They should not have fallen down in the way that we saw. And there are questions after questions after questions you can ask, and I'm not going to ask them tonight because I suspect that most of you know them. If you don't know why people doubt the official story of 9-11, find out. You owe it to yourself and to your friends and family to find out. Because, of course, it's, you know, what followed that really mattered. Um, that said, those that have been trying to find out and have found some very interesting details and a lot of key witnesses on the day who can testify to things like explosives in the buildings, well, funnily enough, quite a lot of them have died. How many? Twelve at the moment. Of that, isn't it? in mysterious circumstances. So, again, somebody's covering the trail. So, in Britain, we then had, in 2005, our own kind of mini 9-11, where we had these Muslims, we are told, who set off bombs on the London Underground and a bus. There are so many problems with this story. I don't know exactly what did happen, but the official narrative does not make sense. First of all, the time codes have been altered on the videos. They're not accurate. Uh, we've only ever had one of the bombers identified by his face. The rest we don't really know. Some say they were actually working for the authorities. Some say they were even fooled, a bit like Imad Salem, fooled into taking live explosives when they thought they were taking part in an exercise, which has been acknowledged an exercise was going on that day that visualized exactly the same things happening at exactly the same targets, just the same as on 9-11, where we're told there were exercises that visualize exactly what happened there. And there are so many problems. There are claims that suddenly, just when the bus was going to where it should have gone, two cars diverted it into Tavistock Square, which has a lot of New World Order connotations. And there's a lot of, even in the mainstream, this information is available, a lot of witnesses on the day said the explosions came up from beneath the trains, not inside from the rucksacks. And there are several people who've testified to that, and there are photographs you'll find on the internet clearly show blasts beneath the trains. But again, it got us on message, it made us joy in the war against terror, and everything that's happened since, of course, of course, you know, with the campaigns in the Middle East and everything that I suspect many of you know about spin off so much from that event. It was necessary, it was needed, and it earned a lot of money, of course, for the armaments manufacturers. War is business plus oil, plus all the usual things, needing to build pipelines across several countries. Money, I said I wouldn't cover that, so 
I won't tonight. Suffice to say, you know that the big money controls things. The guys up in the glass towers here, by the way, a nice pyramid on top there, eh? How's that for an occult symbol? It is said, by the way, if you follow the lines of the Pyramid and Canary Wharf, this is, is, is the, the modern financial centre of London, not the city of London, but a little bit outside. If you follow the lines of the pyramid, it is said it gives you the exact dimensions of the Great Pyramid of Giza. That's an interesting coincidence, isn't it? But we know the people in the glass towers could solve all our problems tomorrow if they so chose. They don't because they don't want to. And instead, 9-11 and all the campaigns and the wars we've had since have given birth to the restrictions of freedoms that we, I think, all know about. And I know in Denmark you have your own issues going on. And I've heard it said a couple of times in the last 24 hours, you're being used as a kind of test case to see how far the rest of the world can be pushed in terms of being very organized and stamped and a bit like the old 60s series, The Prisoner. Apparently you have a number here, is that true? Well, I would like to think of The Prisoner. Remember the old series? I am not a number, I am a free man. But, of course, microchipping is coming round the corner. We're already microchipping our pets. Health and safety in Britain is used to control us in the name of keeping us safe, of course. Uh, and we have more surveillance cameras in Britain than any other world, so we're, we're winning on that one. Body scanners that show your wobbly bits at airports. Why? Because we're afraid of terrorism. So, again, as William said, the fear works very well. Briefly, back to Bin Laden and all that. I mean, is there anybody here that really believes it was Bin Laden they shot dead in his underpants? Any takers? Funny that, isn't it? Because, again, there are so many suspicions around it, and we don't need to go into that. It doesn't add up, and no proof was ever offered that he was the man. And funnily enough, some of the people from the SWAT team that took him out, who maybe could have actually given us more details, all died in a helicopter crash shortly after. So we can't ask them now, isn't that curious? But one thing about Bin Laden, let's briefly then bring this man into things. So big new Brzezinski is seen as a key architect of the New World Order. Um, let us bear in mind that he it was that in effect created Al-Qaeda. Want the evidence? There he is, showing Bin Laden how to use a gun. Because of course in the days of the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, they needed freedom fighters, so they got the Mujahideen and gave them arms and said, you fight the Russians, and, and you're good boys and girls. And that was all fine until one day it didn't suit the Americans to see it that way, so of course then they were reclassified as terrorists. I wouldn't say to you Al-Qaeda doesn't exist, I think that it does, but I would say that its importance was certainly massively exaggerated over the years, to the point where it's self-fulfilling. It's becoming the very big organization that we talked it up to be. But I think there's a lot of evidence. They were a bunch of tin pot militias who were sort of like not that effective, who we've elevated to a position now of being this incredible controlling force. Although now, funnily enough, we find ourselves on the same side by saying we might back the Syrian rebels. So we live in very strange times. And um, we're not going to go into Syria, Egypt, or any of that tonight. Suffice to say, there's clear evidence of Western interference there from the start, wherever that story is going to go. And I have a feeling it's not going to plan, actually. So maybe there's hope there, but we shall see. But getting back br briefly to Brzezinski, of course, this wouldn't be a problem if he still wasn't so influential. He was one of Obama's backers. And although publicly he has not agreed with everything Obama has done, there's no question he's the father figure in the background. And if you haven't already read it, do go and find a copy of Brzezinski's book, The Grand Chessboard, in which he pretty much lays out the New World Order plan as a marvellous thing. This is the thing, you've got to get into their heads. They think they're doing good. He says it's marvellous to control the world and, you know, do what we need to do to set up conflicts if it makes the world, well, not a good and happy place, but a controllable place. And he sees that as a good and happy place. And... Some people think there was a good intention behind the New World Order. Some people don't think people like Arthur Balfour was evil. He really thought the world would be better if we civilised it. 
But now it's turned into this. And now what's happened is power's fallen away from our democracies or whatever stood for them once. And so now it resides in organizations like this. Interesting to note, though, that this year in Britain, the Bilderberg Group, of course, had one of their meetings there. And there were protests. And it did get some mainstream coverage. And two of our ministers were forced to stand up in Parliament and explain what they were doing at the Bilderberg Group meetings. And they didn't make a very good job of it. They came across badly. So now they're under the spotlight. People know in these quangos, in these strange, undemocratic organizations that effectively run our lives, they know that we now know that they exist. So that is going to change things, I think. If you go onto the internet, you will find many diagrams of how they think the world is really run. And you can choose yourself where you think you are in it. If you think you're up here, what are you doing here? Apparently, we're all down here, the sheep at the bottom. Who's at the top, though? Who's at the top? Well, for some people, of course, the person at the top is this person. Now, I'm not going to go today into the whole David Icke reptilian agenda thing, except to say some people think there are certainly bloodlines that have governed the world for a long time, and the Queen is clearly still a powerful figure. Not politically, but symbolically she is. Watch the footage of George W. Bush addressing a, a, a dinner where the Queen was present and see how humbled he is. Even he knew it was time to shut up because this woman was in charge. Whether she's in charge of the whole world conspiracy, well, I don't know. And whether the bloodline is extraterrestrial, as some believe, I don't know. Does it really matter? There is certainly evidence that there are strange things flying around in our skies. There's certainly evidence, I think, of extraterrestrial cover-ups. But whether you think that's what's behind the New World Order project is another matter. And does it really make any difference? You're up against the same thing, whether they're evil aliens or human beings. Okay? So I would argue it's not worth spending too much time on that. So I'm going to start, believe it or not, to pull this to a close. Right? Five minutes. Bear with me. The problem is we know there is a cult influence. There is a cult influence. I'm sure most of you are aware of the Bohemian Grove rituals where some of the, the great and the good and the bad, mostly the bad, of world leaders go and dress up in funny robes and attend the cremation of care ceremony once a year where they sacrifice the effigy of a child to a giant stone owl. And some of you may be thinking, yeah, this is old hat, we know this. For some people, it may be a shock to know this goes on. Very famous people go. Here's a shot of Bohemian Grove many years back. Ronald Reagan there, Richard Nixon. And the occult symbolism is so strong that you have to say, this really does count for something for these people. Now, they try to say it's all a silly pageant when they talk about it at all. But mostly, they won't say anything. But funnily enough... Only one president has ever referred, as far as I'm aware, directly to the Bohemian Club. Because it's not denied, but it's not talked about. But Bill Clinton is the only one that went public with a statement. Somebody at a rally said, hey, what about the Bohemian Club? And interesting to note, Bill Clinton's response. He said, did you say Bohemian Club? That's where all those rich Republicans go and stand naked against redwood trees, right? Well, I've never been to the Bohemian Club, but you ought to go. It'll be good for you. You'd get some fresh air. That's typical Clinton humor, but it's an acknowledgement that it's real. We don't have the time to go into this tonight. Go and find out about the Bohemian Grove rituals if you want more. But some say it's nothing, it's a distraction. Others say it's a deep, occult, very dangerous thing. But certainly, dressing up in funny robes and worshipping giant stone owls, which is their main emblem, seems like a funny thing for our world leaders to do on their holidays. And Bill Clinton, funny man, eh? Funny man. Okay, get this, right? you like this. The Clintons number of ex-associates of the Clintons or investigators who have died in mysterious circumstances, right? Roll of drums. Imagine a roll of drums in your head. 50. Look up a website, the Arkansas Sudden Death Syndrome. There are so many mysterious deaths, one of which includes a man who drank himself to death on domestic mouthwash. There's something... I, now, I'm not accusing the Clintons of doing this, but I would just say this, there's somebody around them that really doesn't like them and their associates, or there's certainly a jinx associated with them. So, laugh at him, but at your peril. 
There are people that go to Bohemian Grove now and campaign, people like Alex Jones with a bullhorn and shouts at them and they protest. And maybe that's why there are plans to get rid of us all. Because, of course, one of the big conspiracy theories that we're hearing more and more about is the depopulation program. If you go into the state of Georgia in America, you may find these stones, the Georgia Guidestones, which seem to have in several different languages recommendations for the future of the world in a kind of a new world order vision. And one of the things that it says we should have is a world court, or in effect, a one world government. One of the other things it advocates and says would be marvellous is eugenics, so going back to H.G. Wells again and all of that. But the, the most disturbing thing of all is that it says the global population should be kept below 500 million. That would mean wiping out pretty much 90% of the population, which is all well and good, but who gets to decide, eh? A lot of people think there are plans afoot to reduce the population, either through viruses or general poisoning us through terrible additives in our foods, and therefore they go and they protest occasionally. Every now and then the Georgia Guidestones get uh, vandalized. The elite want 80, or sorry, 80% of us dead. So this is beginning to upset people. And of course that then ties into people's feelings uh, about the whole chemtrails phenomenon. Whether you think it's poisoning or a suppressant or engineering for some strange solar event they're expecting, well, there's clearly something weird flying around in our skies. How much of it is natural, natural aeroplane trails, how much of it is fake? Well, you must decide, but you're going to hear more about that from Frank tomorrow, I do believe, who's done some very serious study into it. And there is a feeling now from a lot of people that we're being attacked from all sides. The other one, of course, is HARP or things like HARP. You don't know what the HARP project is. Um, I mean, officially, it's offline at the moment. They say it's not working, although you may be surprised to learn not everybody believes that. Um, however, they set this up in Alaska in 2007, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. And officially, it's there to sort of do experiments with rocking the ionosphere, military communications. They can create their own aurora in the sky now by zapping the sky with energies. The problem is, a lot of people think it's doing more than that, and some people think it's responsible for some of the terrible disasters that we've had, whether it be earthquakes or volcanoes or tsunamis, and they're using it to create, if you like, weather wars, that they can actually generate disasters and make it look natural which seem to occur to countries at odd times. Now, I can't tell you if this is true or not, but I can tell you this. The fact that so many people believe this is going on is a sign of how badly things have suddenly gone. We cannot go on like this. Either they wipe us out, or we stand up and we do something about this, because this is no way for the world to be. And never mind harp or scalar waves or whatever you think's been zapped, because there's lots of other theories around that. We don't know what satellites are going on. There are satellites above our heads every minute. We don't know what they're doing to us. They could be zapping our minds. Go back to Brzezinski's book, The Grand Chessboard. He actually advocates that one way of subduing populations would be to beam waves down on them. And this is a marvelous thing. He recommends it. So for all we know, it's already occurring. And in any case, the mind control is overt and active. Anyway, through what we're fed in our TV, the terrible food that we're eating generally, maybe you eat better over here, but you know, it is a concern that we are being attacked from all sides. And that if quite a few of us popped off the planet soon, that would suit the needs of the New World Order. But this is how we are personified, right? There's a fantastic mind conditioning going on that anybody that questions the status quo is a loony that wears the tinfoil hat to stop their mind being controlled. Maybe it works, I don't know. I'm willing to try anything now, really. But that's the problem. This is propaganda to ridicule those that are trying to expose what's going on. It is not fair, it is not true. You see, there are so many things, in Britain alone, We've had the Rupert Murdoch scandal. We found our government was being controlled by Rupert Murdoch, basically. There's police cover-ups being uncovered. 
MPs expenses, bank crisis in other countries, you know, Obama still hasn't shut down Guantanamo Bay, weapons of mass destruction, the revelation recently of the prism system that is surveying us all. Mr. Edward Snowden did a good job. Some say he's part of a conspiracy himself. Who knows? But now we know that the Americans and actually anybody with the technology can listen in to us and probably do if they want to. And here's the thing. Then they ask for our trust. Why don't you trust us? Why are they conspiracy theories? You're all mad. Come on, guys. Everybody knows the game that's being played. They know, we know. And they're just hoping to put off people at the fringes that might be convinced that we really are mad. But the truth is we are under surveillance. The truth is they have plans that don't really suit us. The good news is this. The fact that so many people are now questioning it, the fact that they have to do all this mind wash and conditioning tells you they feel threatened. They know that more and more people are coming to an awareness, and a lot of people think we are literally at the dawning of a new stage of consciousness. Many ancient prophecies said that on 21st of December 2012, in our modern calendar reckoning, would be not the end of the world, like the media said. Again, that was conditioning. That it would be the beginning of a huge time of change, consciousness shift. And a lot of people think that is exactly what's going on. And a word of warning, don't do what they do, right? There are people in the world who do not have our best interests at heart. I think you can see from this compilation today that there is a pattern that repeats and unfolds. But let us not fall into their trap, because yes, there are bad people, but some of them may even have good intentions, but very misplaced. But we mustn't just point the finger and say, it's them. It's them over there doing it to us. That's what they do to each other. It's him over there. No, you know what? It's us. We allowed the New World Order to become what it is by our collective apathy. Now, it's not our fault entirely. We were trained into that way of thinking. But those that now know the game, you've got a duty. You've got a responsibility to stand up and be counted. And don't just blame them. They are misguided. The Buddhists would say you can't hate them because they are something they can't help themselves. You have to deal with the issue be a bit Jedi about it, but don't do it with hatred, because that way lies the dark path. But there's a truth to that. What we need to do now is not be afraid to stand out from the crowd. I mean, I am lucky enough to address many different audiences where they're quite mainstream, and I try and offer these ideas to people, maybe not in such a direct way as I did today, and I find many people are open to them. People are not just sheep. They can see for themselves what's going on, but they're afraid to say anything because they think other people will ridicule them. When they see others standing up and are willing to voice this stuff, they feel more energized. They feel they can come and join in, and it's all right to think like that. And look at the polls. 90% think Diana was murdered. 90% think David Kelly was murdered. At the last big anniversary poll of 9-11, 10th anniversary, around 50% of the world's population no longer believes the official story of 9-11. Ladies and gentlemen, that is victory. It's happening. But that is also why we need to be absolutely on the lookout. I believe that the next few years are not going to be comfortable ones, but I do believe there's an opportunity here. And we've still got the internet relatively free. Notice how they're trying to take control of it through small print and anti-pornography legislation or whatever it may be. That's fine, but look at the small print. They're trying to shut it down, but they haven't yet. We have a chance to shut them down. Okay? If you are concerned about this, know this. Their time is in danger. The next few years, Right? It's in the balance, but I think we can end this. There's enough people that know what's going on, and it just takes enough people to tip the dominoes and step out of fear. The fear stops people moving forward. There is an opportunity here. And I would just say this to close. You're going to hear a lot of things this weekend, and I've just rattled through a few of them in a very simplistic way you may not agree with all of it, that is fine. But by the time you step out of here, if you're here all weekend on Sunday, don't just forget about it. If you step out of here and then back to normal, no change in your life, it's failed. When you leave here, put this knowledge into operation. 
Go and do something that makes a difference, however small, because it is people like ourselves, okay, that are going to make the difference. And don't be fooled into thinking everyone else is a sheeple. No, they're not. They just don't know how to make a difference, and they don't realize that other people may share their views. When they're given the opportunity to, you're going to begin to see critical mass take care of things. So, thank you very much for listening, and go out and do something. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.